All right. Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Uh, this is a weekly virtual event that we've been running for about three years now. And today we have the privilege to hear from Emma Simons of the University of Otago in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, this is actually a collaboration with the student network on EVs. So if you are a student, a postdoc, um, head over to uh, SNEV Research and check out some of the offerings that they have um, for, the, for the community. Um, you, you may recall that a few weeks ago we heard from Paula Perez and Matthias Ostrowski about how blood plasma EVs can uh, kind of influence macrophages towards a resolution uh, phenotype. And today we're going to learn more about EVs from a very different source um, that can also achieve anti-inflammatory properties of, of macrophages. Um, just before we get started, a reminder that the chat box is open, so everybody's on mute right now, but you can put your comments and your questions in the chat box. And then at the end of Emma's presentation, we will allow unmuting and you can interact with Emma and ask uh, whatever questions you like. Emma, welcome to the EV Club and thank you so much for presenting today. Um, I'd like to invite you to share your screen and um, sure. also the exciting results that you have. Well, hopefully you can see that. Um, awesome, thank you to both the EV Club and SNEV for having me today. Um, I haven't done one of these before, so it's quite exciting. Um, I am Emma, as Ken introduced. I'm from the University of Otago in Wellington, New Zealand, which is the reason for the very odd time of the talk today. Um, I've just finished my PhD, so I'm a postdoc now um, in the same lab that I did my PhD in. So this paper uh, was one of the projects from my PhD. So as our lab is um, a translational lab based at a hospital, I thought I'd give you a bit more background on the clinical problem that we're trying to address, um, which isn't outlined as much in the paper. Um, so I'm sure we all know this, but according to the World Health Organization, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women, and it's estimated that 2.3 million women are diagnosed globally every year. So while the rates are high, the approximate five-year survival rate following treatment is 90%. Um, so many of these women will go on to have breast reconstruction surgery. Um, and this is a really important part of the treatment pathways that can help to improve the quality of life of those patients. So just a very quick background on breast reconstruction for those that don't know. There's currently a number of different um, kinds of breast reconstruction available. Uh, the most commonly known about are probably implants. And while they do have their advantages, they've been known to rupture or migrate within the breast. Um, and it's likely that they'll need to be removed or replaced later on in life. Um, another option is flat-based reconstruction, and this is when um, the muscle is used to reconstruct the breast. Many women prefer this as it provides a more natural outcome than implants can, um, but it can be difficult to undertake on women with comorbidities such as obesity and diabetes, and it's also a highly technical procedure, so it's got high morbidity rates and long recovery times. So what we're interested in is the relatively new technique known as autologous fat grafting. Um, so this has the advantage of being able to produce a natural cosmetic outcome with a really low associated surgical risk. So it's when you isolate fat from one part of the body, so the um, hip, thigh, abdomen, um, and then you re-inject it into the breast to recreate the, um, the breast shape. So the one problem with fat grafting so far is that there's really variable rates and the amount of that grafted tissue that retains within the breast. Um, and it's thought that improving the relationship between the donor tissue and that breast cavity itself could be one way that we could improve uh, retention rates of that graft. So just to demonstrate this problem in our centre, um, I'll just really quickly show you a pilot study that we undertook um, in our Wellington Hospital here. Um, so we had patients undergo an MRI before their fat grafting procedure and then approximately three months later, and we just looked at the rates of their tissue retention. Um, so you can see just from this small study that there's really variable rates in the amount of tissue that's retained within the breast, and it can be as low as 30% of that grafted volume. So there's a number of reasons why it's thought that the graft fails to integrate into the breast cavity. Uh, the donor fat's made up of a number of different cell types, and one of the key cells being investigated um, in the context of fat grafting are adipose-derived stem cells, or ADSCs, um, and these are the key regenerative component of adipose tissue. So it's thought that the enrichment of these cells could aid um, in graft retention, as they've been shown to demonstrate anti-inflammatory properties as well as pro-angiogenic properties, both of which are thought to be beneficial for graft survival. So the breast cavity itself, um, after surgical treatment and radiation therapy, 
um, is a really highly inflammatory environment. Um, and there's a lot of recruitment of immune cells into that site. So this, of course, is not really an ideal environment to promote grafted um, tissue survival. And there's a need to manipulate that environment um, in order to improve graft survival. So our lab wanted to determine if the EVs released by adipose-derived stem cells could also produce some of those desired effects um, that the ADSCs themselves have been reported to have. So some early in vivo studies have demonstrated that in particular M2-like or anti-inflammatory macrophages are recruited to the site in response to ADSC or ADSC EV treatment. So we therefore decided to um, conduct some in vitro experiments to determine the functional role of ADSC EVs on macrophages themselves. And this is where our paper comes in. So our paper is published in JX Bio, um, and it actually came out a few weeks before my Viva for my PhD, which was quite helpful. Um, so we looked at how ADSC EVs influence the inflammatory profile of macrophages in vitro, um, with the thought process that if they could um, reduce the inflammatory phenotype of macrophages, that we could potentially promote graft survival um, in the future. So this is just a really simplified schematic of our methodology, um, just thought it would help everyone to understand exactly what we did. So um, here at the hospital, we can send patients undergoing this uh, fat grafting surgery, and we collect a tissue sample at the time of their surgery. We then isolate out the ADSCs from the sample and we culture them. And then from the media, we isolate the EVs using um, set columns and an automated fraction collector. Um, and also some Amicon ultrafiltration columns just to concentrate them down. Um, we also isolate monocyte-derived macrophages from whole blood, and we polarize them towards an M0 or an M1-like or M2-like phenotype. So we co-cultured these with our ADSC EVs for about 48 hours, and then we lifted the cells and analyzed them using a flow cytometer, and we have a 10-color panel that consists of a range of um, well-established inflammatory and macrophage markers. So I'll breeze over this one really quickly because we're all familiar with the characterization of EVs, um, but it's just the first figure of the paper, so I thought I'd chuck it in here anyway. So we, um, we've used TRIPS to determine the size and concentration of our particles, um, and then we use Western blot to um, demonstrate the presence of TSG101 and CD9, as well as the absence of apolipoprotein um, and nexin. Um, we also visualized our particles using TM, and then we looked at the effect of our EVs on um, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, or HUVEX, um, cultured in the 3D matrix. So we wanted to look at um, how bioactive our EVs were. And you can see that they actually increased the tube formation of those endothelial cells compared to our control. Um, and I will just quickly say that for all the experiments in this paper, um, our control that we used was dummy EVs, which will be labeled as DEVs. Um, and this is just um, media that's been cultured in the absence of cells and it's gone through all the same isolation processes as our ADSC EVs have. So before looking into the effect of um, our EVs on our macrophages, we first wanted co to confirm that they've been polarized towards those M1-like or M2-like phenotypes. Uh, so quite a few of the markers in our panel were specific to those phenotypes. So um, we assessed them in our M0, M1 and M2-like macrophages. Um, so if you're just looking at the UMAP um, on the top left, um, that's just all of our cell types together. And you can see that our M0 cells have clustered together in that quite big cluster on the left-hand side. Um, and then we've got our M2 clusters separate from that, but still quite close to our M0. And then our M1, um, M1 like cells are clustered a bit further away from the others and had a really high expression of those M1 markers. So they separated based off of those um, M1 like and M2 like markers um, that were included in our panel. Uh, we also wanted to assess the morphology um, because they look quite distinctly different under the microscope. So our M1 like had that very classic fried egg appearance. So they're the ones in the middle. Um, they're quite rounded, whereas our M2 like are more stretched out and spindly. And then our M0 are um, closer to our M2, but a bit of a mixture of the both, both of them. Um, so now that we confirmed the polarization towards these um, phenotypes, we wanted to move on and look at um, how our EVs affect them. So this is all of our markers in each of our three phenotypes. So we've got 10 different markers, and this is just looking at the expression level of each of those individual markers first. Um, and the general trend here, I won't go into too much detail on it, is that we're actually seeing a reduction in the majority of these markers across all of our phenotypes. 
Um, it's kind of hard to interpret anything from this. So for this reason, we decided to um, use some high dimensional clustering analysis to better understand the inflammatory states of these macrophages um, with and without ADSC EV treatment and whether um, doing that clustering analysis also reinforces what we're seeing in the individual marker analysis. So I'll show you some of that now, that's the exciting stuff. Um, so it all looks a bit confusing to start with, but I'll walk you through it. So we used a program called OMIC um, to build a pipeline for some high dimensional data analysis. Um, this data set was clustered into phenotypically similar clusters using a flow SOM algorithm. Um, and then meta clusters were ov color overlaid onto the UMAP, um, which you can see on the left. So each color represents a different cluster. Um, and the histograms in the middle just show you how much of each of those 10 markers um, each of our clusters is expressing. So they all have very varying levels of um, expression of each of those markers, which makes them all very unique. Um, so on the right, that's just an outline of um, the marker expression. And we've pulled out some of those markers that make them really distinctly, each cluster distinctly um, unique and different from the other ones. Um, and we've identified six M0 like clusters, two M2 like clusters, two M1 like clusters, and then we've got a, um, a we've called it cluster 10, which is found in all of our polarization states. Um, and it demonstrates low expression of all of the markers. Um, so that's just the blue one up the top. Um, so we could then take these clusters and use them to look at um, how the proportion of our macrophages within each of these um, individual and unique clusters changes in response to treatment with EVs. Um, so again, we just have those same cluster descriptions on the left, um, and then on the right, we've compared the percentage of each of those cell types that's found within each of the um, clusters with DEVs compared to when um, they're clustered with, uh, sorry, when they're, when they're cultured with ADSC EVs. Um, so from this, we can pull out some of the significant changes and the proportion of cells found within each of these clusters. So um, I'll walk you through it as an example. So if we just look at our M0 clusters, which are um, up the top here, there we go. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, these ones, you can see that um, in cluster one, when they're cultured with DEVs, we have almost 35% of our population of cells is found within this cluster. When they're cultured with ADSC EVs, um, we only see about 16% of our cells that um, are found within this cluster one. Alternatively, in clusters six and seven, you can see that we start with about 2.5% of our population found within each of these clusters um, individually. And then when we culture them with ADSC EVs, this jumps up to um, six and 7% of the population. So it looks like some of our macrophages are shifting from cluster one towards clusters six and seven. Um, and so, if we go and look at the cluster descriptions on the left, you can see that cluster one is really highly expressing a lot of those markers. So CD36, CD206, and CD86. Um, whereas our clusters six and seven are expressing those markers to a much lower level. So what we can infer from this is that when cultured with ADSC EVs, we're seeing a shift from um, cells being in those um, really highly inflammatory states towards um, a much lower inflammatory phenotype, which is really interesting. Um, we also see this in our um, M1 clusters as well. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through that because that's a pretty good example of, because there's only two clusters, it's a lot easier to understand. Um, so here's just the example of our M1 clusters, clusters three and eight. Um, so, Cluster three is in the green um, and cluster eight's in the gray. And so as you can see on the histograms for each of our, I've just pulled out four markers here, CD206, 36, 163, and 11B. But you can see that um, cluster three expresses all of these markers to a higher level um, than cluster eight does. And then when we look at um, with DEVs compared to ADSC EVs, you can see that the proportion of our cells um, found within cluster three and with DEVs um, decreases when we culture them with ADSC EVs, which is really interesting. And we see the reciprocal in cluster eight. Um, so if we want to look at the numbers, they both start with about 50% of the population being found within each of our clusters. So 48.5% in cluster three and 49.6% in cluster eight. And then when we culture them with um, ADSC EVs, 
we see a decrease in the proportion found within cluster three with the cluster with that really high inflammatory profile. Um, so that drops to 26%. And then the proportion of our cells found within cluster eight actually increases to 73%. Um, so it looks like we're seeing a shift from cluster three, the high inflammatory state, towards cluster eight, which is that really low inflammatory state. Um, which is really interesting. So overall, it looks like when our um, macrophages are cultured with our ADSC EVs, we're seeing a shift towards a lower inflammatory state in both our M0 and our M1 um, clusters. So what we can infer from this paper is that we've defined a population of ADSC EVs that does significantly affect macrophage phenotype um, across multiple polarization states. So we saw it in our M0 macrophages and our M1 macrophages. Um, this shift towards a lower expression profile of these markers um, involved in all of these functional processes is really promising um, in that context of graph retention. So as I talked about at the start, um, increased activation of inflammatory cells in the breast cavity is thought to be one of the contributing factors to low retention rates. Um, and that increase in inflammation can be due to that um, surgical treatment, radiation therapy um, after having breast cancer. Um, and so we've demonstrated that ADSC EVs do have an immunomodulatory role on macrophages in vitro. And this demonstrates their potential use um, in the future as a therapeutic in the context of graft retention, which is really exciting. Um, so going forward, obviously macrophages aren't the only cell type found within the breast cavity that could be um, playing a role in this. So um, there's also things like um, the fibrotic state. So um, we can look at how we're currently looking at how um, ADSC EVs affect fibroblast activity um, and also looking into things like angiogenesis. So to provide nutrients to that grafted tissue um, is really important to promote graft survival. So it's a combination of all these factors um, in that microenvironment, but um, it's looking really promising here that we're seeing an anti-inflammatory effect from those um, EVs, which is really exciting. Um, so just this is just a bunch of people that have helped work on the paper, um, particularly my PhD supervisors um, who are all listed there. And I'm in um, Dr. Kirsty Danielson's lab here in, in Wellington. Um, sorry, I talked pretty fast, but I'm happy to take uh, questions if we've got any. I'll have a look at the chat. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for sharing that with us. Um, I think there's there's a lot of, um, um, you know, excitement in, in you know, ways that we can modulate uh, macrophages, and you've shown you, you've shown that this particular source is particularly good at it. Um, mm -hmm. So what's what's next in terms of taking this into in vivo models or into the clinic? You know, what are what are some um, you know some research tools that that you could use to do that? Yes, so we're currently working on creating um, a three D multicellular in vitro model first. Because um, obviously, as I just talked about, it's a like a number of different factors that could be important in that um, interaction. We want to see if ADC EVs influence multiple different um, pathways or cell types. Um, so we're working on that first and then moving into um, in vitro models down the line. I'm actually um, moving overseas next year, so I don't get to do it myself, which is a bit sad. But um, there's talk that we'll move it into a um, mouse model, hopefully in the next couple of years. Um, and then we can actually look at graft retention itself as well, as opposed to just the influence on the cell types and the pathways, um, which will be really interesting. There's actually been talk that the best model for this kind of work is actually a pig model. Um, we're not really, we don't have the facilities for large animal models here yet, but um, it seems like it would be the most relevant. You know, you could induce um, a tumor in the model and then perform a surgical resection and then perform the um, the fat grafting and kind of monitor it over time. And then you could look at something like um, whether the cancer comes back and safety. And so there's a lot of, a lot of paths that we could take, which is um, exciting. Yeah, it's, it's certainly true in science that what we sow one day might be harvested by others down the road. Um, so, so we mm -hmm. all, have, you know, we, we, we have different projects throughout our, <laughs> our careers and, you know, so, so congratulations anyway, for, for, um, for, for getting this started. So, so nicely. Um, I do Thanks. see that we have some uh, some questions that are coming in in the chat box. So I will um, I will call on people. Um, please be ready to unmute yourself and feel free to also show your camera if you would like to. Um, so I have a few more questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the chat box <laughs> for now. So let's start 
Let's start with uh, with John Bissler. John, you have a nice question about the cells. Yeah, I, thank you very much. I'm curious, do you have an idea of where the EVs you've isolated, where do they actually come from? Do you know what cells are involved in their production? I have a specific odd interest in vascular parasites. I wondered if they're part of it. Yeah, so the EVs we're looking at are from adipose-derived stem cells. Um, so we isolate the ADSCs from um, fat samples from patients at the hospital. Um, and we've characterized that the cells that we're looking at are adipose-derived stem cells. So we've done some flow cytometry, some differentiation of those cells. Um, yeah, so they're quite a unique cell type that not many people know about, um, but it looks like they have some pretty exciting properties um, mm -hmm. in adipose tissue. But that's all we've looked at so far is that that one cell types EVs. I appreciate that. I didn't know much about them and I still don't. <laughs> not um, many hey. people do. So John, your your question, um, do, do, you, do you suspect that there might be some other cell types that are present here? Yeah, I really did, yeah. Uh, I wondered... It, in that cell population, uh, you have uh, this population of cells and it's enriched for the adipose stem cells, but what other cells are in there? Uh, and I uh, think- Yeah, yeah. So the, we isolate the stromal vascular fraction, which obviously has all those other cell types in it. Um, but as we kind of culture them over time, we don't use them until about their third passage. Um, we've looked at, um, different flow markers to see if we do have any other cell types from that stromal vascular fraction population. I um, mean, it looks like we have about a 98% of our cells are adipose-derived stem cells, according to our analysis. So currently, it looks like all our EVs are from ADSCs, but it would be interesting to look at EVs from other cell types in that fraction. Curiously, there's really no good marker for pericytes, especially after a third passage. Uh, so oh, I'm yeah, okay. Yeah, we've only kind of excluded, um, I think our panel only um, accounts for things like uh, endothelial cells and uh, other immune cells. So they could be in there. Very interesting. All right. Thank you, John. Um, Lucia Languino. Hello. Uh, hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, <laughs> Emma. Great talk. I just Thank have a you. one. So how stable upon EV incubation, how stable is the phenotype? Like, uh, could you keep this in culture and then see if it uh, the changes that you observe remain stable? Uh, the macrophage phenotype? Yeah, the macrophage phenotype, yeah. Yeah, so we've been able to keep them for, I think, up to three weeks at the moment, but we haven't really tried to keep them beyond that. Um at their M1 like or M2 like phenotype because we just haven't had a need to yet. But um, I think before we moved into some EV, uh, in vivo models, it would be important to look at the stability of the phenotypes and whether it can shift once it's been polarized in one direction back um, towards another direction or towards the naive phenotype. But, but if you do it at two weeks or one week, what do you observe? Because mm -hmm. I'm just wondering the time that you selected that might just be... Uh, did you do yeah, so... Yeah, okay. So we polarized them for a week. Um, we started with two weeks and then we compared it to a week and they looked pretty much exactly the same. So just to save time, essentially, we cut it down to a week and then we co-cultured them with the EVs for just 48 hours because we were set, We did a dose response and a time response over time and we saw a difference in the phenotype. So, But the EV yeah. took me 48 hours. What if you go 72 or more? Um, so we didn't really see any difference as we increased the... Time. So it looks like they're having a pretty quick effect on the macrophages. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so if I may, I think related to this, uh, what would be the mode of treatment in the clinic? Would you be injecting these EVs directly into tissue, or or how would you how would you envision that occurring? So I think the the easiest way to kind of get it into the clinic would be at the time of the fat grafting surgery, if you could mix it in with the fat tissue that's going to be re-injected into the breast. So as you aspirate the fat um, out from wherever it's coming from, um, from the donor site, if you could then somehow mix in the EVs and before it's re-injected. Um, so it would kind of be definitely be beneficial as an off-the-shelf therapy, so not necessarily um, an autologous therapy, um, but obviously there's a whole lot of other issues that come with that. So there'd be a lot of testing that needs to be done before you could determine if you could use it as that kind of, heterologous off-the-shelf therapy but definitely mixing it in at the time of surgery would 
um, be the easiest way to do it in terms of streamlining it into the clinic. Interesting considerations. Yes. Okay. So Natalie Turner, you have a very interesting question here. Hey, Emma. Um, congrats hey. on the talk. It was really Thank good. Um, so wonderful. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of a, a off kind of target question about mm -hmm. hormonal regulation and um, how it affects macrophage populations. Um, and I say that because there was this really awesome nature immunology paper that came out maybe a few months ago, and it looked at um, lactation specific macrophage populations in the breast, and that there were resident macrophage populations, but also these ones that, that are unique um, during lactation and also pregnancy. So I mm -hmm. um, Obviously, your patient population, um, if it's from breast cancer, perhaps they've had chemotherapy, perhaps not. Um, I guess it would differ between patients. And with regard to their actual cycle themselves, like hormonal control of, of macrophages in the breast, how it might change just during the normal menstrual cycle. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered if perhaps there could be some differences related to what time in that cycle the, the graft is being performed. Perhaps things are changing with regard to the macrophages. Perhaps there are these subpopulations of macrophages that could be affecting the, the mm -hmm. retention. And I just wondered if you had found anything in the literature while doing your your study um, and if if you had come across any subpopulations during your work yeah um unfortunately I've honestly come across nothing which tells us a lot about women's health I guess at the moment um it's fat grafting itself is very very new um and particularly I think because these patients have all had a mastectomy so removal of um removal of the breast tissue people don't really focus on what's left there anymore after their treatment um I know that um, our surgeons collect a lot of clinical pathological information but never anything related to hormone or cycle um you've given me a good idea for a new project though I'm just thinking of it that we could be collecting some of this information along with um so we look at things like BMI um and diabetic state and all of that kind of stuff um, so it be, could be interesting to do the just collect that information alongside it, like what part of their cycle they're at um, when they're having this procedure. But no, I've never even heard a surgeon mention it. I don't think it's on their radar at all. Um, and I haven't really seen anything in the literature either, which is, um, it would be interesting though, definitely would be interesting. Yeah, thanks. I thought as much. It seemed like it was a bit of a scarcity of, of literature in that oh, area, definitely. but you're right women's health we need more funding for it so <laughs> definitely you can, you can maybe pave the way <laughs> <laughs> thanks Nat. great yeah more funding more research uh definitely yeah. um you know we, we all we always want to know too what is the mechanism and to that end we have a nice question here from phil Askenes. Mm -hmm. hi it's a very uh, interesting study um thank you it, it seemed like it's uh, for aya for M2 steering, the main cytokine you were dealing with was IL-4. Yes. And um, you didn't mention anything about the cytokines uh, in the development of the M2 max. Um, mm -hmm. And also, did you try IL-10 or TGF-beta as M2 steering? Um, so so the, role, the role of the cytokines and question other cytokines. Yeah. So the way that we, we're not an immunology-based lab, unfortunately, but the way that we picked our um, stimulatory factors was purely based off the literature. So there were a few studies that were using monocyte-derived macrophages in a similar way to us um, in vitro. And so we, for M2, like, I think I tried a number of different things. So I tried IL-4, MCSF, um, and a couple of other, I think I might've tried TGF better, um, but we found that the ones that produced what we visualized and saw under in that kind of UMAP rendering as the most M2-like was the combination of IL-4 and MCSF. Um, and similarly with M1, we used um, GMCSF and interferon gamma. Um, we played around with the timings and the concentrations of each of them. So we based it 
mostly of the literature and then kind of tweaked it within our lab as we needed to but um it could definitely if we could definitely play around with it a little bit more and try and push them further in each of those directions it's really hard with macrophages though because obviously we talk about them as m1 or m2 but really it's a spectrum of polarity so we don't necessarily know how far along that spectrum we need or want to push the polarization it's more as just kind of a way to push them towards those two different pro and anti-inflammatory phenotypes and then that's why we brought in the high dimensional clustering analysis so that we can really pull out lots of different um almost phenotypes of macrophages but just unique subsets of macrophages so we didn't really play around with um sorry to answer your question I got a bit off track there we didn't really play around with um any other cytokines as such um just because we were seeing that polarization already yeah well, IL-4 is a, a classical steering agent. Mm -hmm. and now, the EVs are. So did you look into whether the role of IL-4 versus the EVs in the steering? Um, so that this is kind of the reason why we included the M0 population, um, to see if adding the EVs would push them down a similar um, trajectory so would it push them towards an M2 like in the similar way that IL4 would. We didn't specifically look at any of the pathways, we haven't done any um, proteomics analysis on what's in our EVs or anything like that yet because it's very preliminary and we're just looking at do they have an effect and then if they do then we can look into how they're having that effect. So they could very possibly be um, doing it in a similar way to IL4 but we just haven't kind of boiled it down to the exact mechanisms that's taking place yet. Well, keep going. Keep Thank going. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil, for that exhortation. Very important. Um, you know, and I guess related to this, can you exclude, would you say for sure that all of the effects that you're seeing are due to EVs themselves? Or perhaps um, is it possible that there are some co-isolated things, even cytokines that could be, mm -hmm. uh, could be contributing here? Always possible. Um, obviously, we've used set columns um, and ultrafiltration, but there's no way that we can get a completely pure population. It's definitely possible that we're seeing effects on other co-isolated particles of a similar size um, that are found within their ADSC media. Um, mm. So yeah, it's never never 100% EVs, um, but we're just showing that the isolates, whatever they are, hopefully majority of them are EVs. Um, are facilitating some kind of anti-inflammatory effect. Yeah, certainly the SEC approach seems to be a good way to get rid of a lot of the free proteins, but uh, but you know nothing nothing is absolute. So no, never. Uh, yeah, and um, there is one more question here, and this is from Shah Savari, but I believe that um, that this questioner has had to leave. Uh, but the question is, um, on the basis of your experience, what are the limitations of using these EVs? So you've shown what they can do. What are, what are some of the, the issues that might, uh, some hurdles that you might need to overcome <laughs> before getting to the clinic? I think some of the biggest hurdles are that step from the bench to the clinic. Obviously, we've still got a reasonably long way to go in terms of using EVs as a, as a safe therapeutic. Um, so it's great that we can show that in our models here that they're facilitating an effect that we think might be beneficial. Um, but then how do we upscale that? How do we do it in a safe way that um, can be used as, yeah, as a therapeutic agent? And so I think um, obviously there's random little issues like set columns aren't um, sterile. And so that's obviously not a product that you could use um, in the clinic yet, but we are obviously a very growing field and things are moving very quickly in terms of industry. And so hopefully by the time that we move this through um, in vivo models and everything, and we start to see um, whether these will actually be a beneficial therapeutic, we could have some of those technologies developed by then. But I think definitely our biggest hurdle at the moment is they're great um, in the lab, but we can't necessarily translate that into the clinic safely yet. Mm. Indeed. All right. We have uh, one more question here from Phil. Uh, the starting cells. The yes. They're using autologous or perhaps one a source of allo starting cells. So I think the most beneficial and easily um, translatable one is to use allogenic um, EVs or allogenic cells. And so 
what we want to start doing is develop some kind of screening tool to screen different donors um, and figure out what the kind of levels of safety or um, different clinical or demographic demographic information is um, so that we can choose those donors um, going forward and then we can use it as an allergenic therapy because obviously if we needed to use it autologous that would involve the patient coming in beforehand so that we could take a sample culture their cells isolate their evs and then um, at the time of their surgery use their own evs um, as their therapeutic um, which just adds a whole nother pressure into the healthcare system that we probably can't maintain um, so if we could use it as an allergenic kind of we like to call it an off-the-shelf therapy where we have a, a base storage of these essentially like a drug and when the surgeon's ready to use it um, in theater they can just kind of grab it from a freezer or off the shelf or wherever it is um, and inject it during that procedure. So allergenic would be the easiest, I think, to translate into the clinic, but um, it obviously comes with its own issues. So we've got a few um, steps in the pathway that we need to go through to um, prove that that's going to be safe. Do you envision you using one allo donor for all of I think it would be probably multiple. Um, there's never a shortage of fat, particularly in um, liposuction or um, those kind of procedures, especially in um, private hospitals here. Um, so you could kind of collect from a, a huge subset of patients and then just pull all of the samples um, and then use that as an allergenic therapy for anyone coming in for this procedure. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these are important questions to consider. Yeah, definitely. And from John, and John, feel free to jump in too, um, but John asks, if allogeneic, do these EVs express HLA? Do you know that? We don't know yet. So we haven't looked at any, really any of the markers yet, aside from um, just the ones I showed for the, essentially the MySeth guidelines characterization. Um, so one of the next steps we want to do is look at um, the different, things that these EVs express. Um, we've got a collaborator in Australia that um, we're talking about doing some proteomics analysis on these EVs. Um, so we can actually start to figure out what they're made of and what could be facilitating these effects. And also as things like this, what could be um, potentially causing some issues down the track. So in short, we don't know. <laughs> That's very important. That's very good. Thank you. All right. Well, it does appear that we have now come to the end of the questions in the chat box. Um, and Emma, I would like to thank you so much for sharing this work with us today. Um, no worries. Thank so you again for having uh, me. <laughs> yeah. Also, wish you the very best as um, as as you move on to your next position. Um, thank and also you. To, to the lab as they continue continue this work. <laughs> um, thanks. So, so thanks thanks to you and uh, thanks for all of our um, attendees today and for all the great questions. And thanks to Snev uh, for helping to facilitate this session. All right, hope everybody has a great rest of the week and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.